Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dropping the Gloves. Thank you for joining us, Tim. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. It's Friday. How bad could I be? I'm a little perturbed. Oh, no. You know, when you you have a date with somebody and they cancel last minute, that just happened to me. I'm a little upset. That's never happened to me. I never? Oh, that's a good question, because you're in the single scene. Have you ever gone out on a date with somebody or had a date planned and you show up and they weren't exactly what they said they were they catfished you a little bit and you just left before you even introduced yourself no no i mean sometimes people aren't as cute as their pictures but no not i've never been catfished or tricked no honest i mean so so you go on 10 dates 10 different women how often is the picture in their profile just way nicer than they look in person? Or is it usually pretty close? It's usually pretty close in my experience. I've heard, I think the bigger thing from what I've heard is that guys like lie about their height more. Like anything, anything above five, nine to six feet is actually five, eight, five, nine. You know, if they say they're five eleven, then they're actually, they're five, eight, you know, Do people they say, say their height in their profile. Yeah, yeah, they do. Height, height, not weight, but how tall are you, Tim? Uh, six three. Wow, so that means you're actually six two. Uh, well, I'm somewhere between six two and six three, so it does ring true. You are, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, Gosh, I'd, I'd be a hit on a dating apps six eight three quarters. Ching, ching. Yeah. that's almost too tall. That's too tall. Yeah, you're way taller than a person's supposed to be. I know. I know. I'm lucky <laughs> I met my wife when I did. All right, moving yeah. on. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Give Better. They're fantastic. I, I talk about them every show because I love them. Visit givebetter.app slash DTG. Take a quick little survey, Tim. Time's running out. Two weeks away from the big draw. Two tickets, any NHL game that you want, which is unheard of. Everybody gives away tickets, but they're two tickets to a game in a market you don't want to go to. They're dumpy games. They're going to be a Wednesday afternoon, and they're playing a garbage team. You get to pick your game, everybody. It's crazy that this is an option. Only Dropping the Gloves has this offer. Go to givebetter.app slash DTG. Do a quick survey. Enter for your chance. And then while you're there, sign up. And it's socially responsible gambling. You place a bet for $10. You lose. It happens. Guess what? $2.50 goes to charity. Tax write-off. You're doing a good thing. You can pat yourself on the back, even though you lost a bet. So it's a win-win, Tim. I say it every show because I mean it. Give better. It's it's a great company. So check them out. Tell them we sent you. It's big help for us. Big help for them. Big help for the charity that you're going to pick. Just think of all the think of all the children you're going to help with their gambling losses. Right, Tim? It's, it's a good way to us. justify it to yourself. Not about us. It's never been about us. It's always about the kids. It's about the kids. Tim, so. I actually was reading an article today about Big Brothers Big Sisters here in Traverse City. They say they miss you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they mentioned you by name. They said it's been a real morale kind of downward turn since Tim Wurzberger left the area. Kids miss well, him. That makes sense. That checks out. Yeah. That was the best. You know who else has a morale kind of bummer this week is the Ottawa Senator's owner. Why did he have a little bad week, Tim? What's going on in Ottawa? Yeah, this is a crazy story. And I kind of went deep on it because I, I didn't really feel like I understood all the details. I just know that they got fined. They're going to have to give up a draft pick. And the new owner, Michael Ann Lauer, goes out and just roast the league, roast the ownership, roast his D D GM. Pierre Dorian was fired. So before we get to that stuff, let's go back. We'll go back to the beginning of the story. The NHL announced that the Senators must for forfeit a future first-round pick over the next three years. They get to choose which year for their role in the botched deal because they did not originally su supply Dadnov's no-trade list to the Golden Knights upon his arrival in 2021. So they get to pick which. So back in 2022, Vegas had egg on their face, quote-unquote, from this article article from Daily Faceoff at the March 21st trade deadline. They agreed to send Dadanov and a conditional second round pick to the Ducks in exchange for the contracts of John Moore and Ryan Kessler, who was a salary dump. The deal was for salary cap purposes. Pending the trade call, Dadanov's agent nixed the deal and said Anaheim was one of his 10 team no trade list. One issue Vegas never had 
that no trade list. They had no recording, no record at all of receiving that list from Ottawa. So they had no idea he even had one, um, which is just crazy. And so Dadnov stood his ground, which is his right. And Vegas looks like an idiot in this whole thing. So the investigation takes almost two years to dig into this stuff. And they finally come back and say, okay, now Ottawa has to give up a first round pick in one of the next three drafts as punishment for not disclosing the 10 team, no trade deal to the Vegas golden Knights. So that happens. Pierre Dorian gets fired. Well, let's talk about that before we get into the owner's comments, because I think that's a whole lot to unwrap right there. And it just shows just the incompetence at play here between the NHL and its clubs, because this should not happen. The NHL is a world-class league. It's one of the big four. Things like this should not happen, right? There should be checks and balances. There should be documents. There should be lawyers. There should be agents involved. If a player gets traded, you should know everything about that trade, everything about that player, everything about his contract. You would think that's a no-brainer. But it just shows you the level, lack of just professionalism between teams during the league, in the league. It's crazy to me that you can trade a player of Dadunov's talent because he he's a good player. Like that, like he well, he wasn't getting trade for traded for a fifth rounder like I was. So he gets traded to Vegas. Why, why do the Vegas Golden Knights not ask for his contract? Because all of this is laid out in his contract, right? Don't you want to know what you're trading for? And I, I don't know who the GM at the time was for Vegas, if it was McCrimmon or it was Mc, George McPhee, who it was. But do you think this was a play by the Vegas Golden Knights to say, you know, we did, we never saw anything. We're not going to ask for anything. I, I don't know. This, this just seems so bizarre to me that you're trading for a guy and you wouldn't ask for his contract because it's all laid out. It's public knowledge. I can go find his contract right now. You go to capfriendly.com. It says, okay, no trade clause. When does that kick in? How long is that for? New move clause. He has a 10 team, no trade clause. It's there. Like we do it all the time, Tim. I, I don't understand how this doesn't get figured out. And so I, I don't. This is more Vegas's fault just as much as his Ottawa's fault, but it all stems from Pierre Dorian. I guess he's culpable. He's the guy who has to send along everything and notify the Vegas Golden Knights GM, like, hey, this is this is his contract. This was the 10 teams that he submitted. And you only get to submit those 10 teams once, apparently. I've never had that, but it looks like if you have an eight-year contract and you get asked for a 10-team list in year two, that's the list you have to ride with for the rest of the way, regardless of how things change and families and standings and teams and whatever. That's your 10 teams. So Pierre did not send that list along with Evgeny Dadanov when he went to Vegas. And herein lies the problem. So to me, the punishment is pretty harsh. And now hey, you're the GM of the, who knows who the GM is of the Ottawa Senators at this point. Which year do you pick? Is it 2020? Like which year do you pick? It's almost one of these things where you kick the can down the road and you're like, oh, we'll be good in 2026. So that's the draft pick we're going to use because it's going to be in the lower 20s. Fast forward, it could be a terrible decision if your team just craters and you have injuries. Now you're looking at giving up a lottery pick potentially because your team tanks that year. So it's almost like a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush because you don't know what's what you're expecting. How is that year going to play out? You're expecting your team to be good. All of a sudden you stink and now you're giving up a high draft pick, whereas a 2024 draft pick could have been maybe a 15 or 16. What do you do, Tim? I, I, just just yeah. that first question. Which, which year would you pick if you're the Ottawa Senators right now? Well, there's so many layers to it because they have 24 hours after the culmination of the draft lottery. So there's like clear... Ugh. It's That's more clarity crazy. on where they are, but 24 hours is not a lot of time. And the other thing too, is like, what if the team is really competitive and they want to go out and, and acquire a player? Now they can't trade their first round pick, or if they do, they're taking away the choices they have. So it's like this extra layer of complexity and decision-making, or say you, you hold on to it, you hold on to it in 2026, they are a very good team. And they, they can't move their most valuable asset to go out and get a player at the deadline because that pick has to be given up um, as a punishment. So like, there's so many, it's crazy. Um, I think you probably do kick the can down the line, like you said, because Ottawa plans on getting better every year. 
And as far as the new GM, I don't know. This is kind of a mess to clean up. They're talking about Peter Chiarelli, which is oh, just... No. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Part of me is like, yeah, go go ruin another franchise. But um, yeah, I don't know. So so Dorian gets fired. And then... Um, and Frank kind of dug into this as as well as many other people. And they kind of like, okay, did he get fired? Did he get resigned? Whatever. And so Michael Andlauer, the new owner, says he met with Pierre Dorian uh, two nights ago. So the penalty for forture of pick should be no less than his job. Quote, unquote, this could have been avoided. Dorian agreed. They agreed to part ways. So then Andlauer speaks to the media. And this is where it gets really fun. He said, quote, why I inherited this is beyond me. Basically saying, like, why didn't I know about this? Yeah. Right. Because you you have this on top of the Shane Pinto investigation. He was suspended for 41 games for gambling and on hockey or something, right? Allegedly. Yeah. Kind of yeah. murky there, but he accepted the punishment. 41 games is the is the standard there. Um, just like it is in other sports, it's half the season. And so um he is two messes here, and but he basically said that the league didn't disclose either of these investigations or at least the details of them during the purchase which I feel like is a really, really important thing. So he takes over a mess that he had nothing to do with either of these things. And he's losing a good young player for half the year. And he's losing a very important pick. And he basically said, like, I'm glad I don't have to be on the phone with the NHL anymore. He's basically spent the last few weeks and months just answering calls and dealing with this stuff, the legality of it all. And then he said, quote, this is where I think it's it's really the nail in the coffin here. Quote, maybe they didn't want to disrupt it to make sure the seller got the best price possible. So if those dis- those investigations were fully disclosed, the value drops. And I don't think Batman really cares about how much one owner buys it from another, except for the value that it has for the rest of the league and the value that one one train one team gets bought, it impacts the value of every other team, right? Just like just with players, the contracts and stuff. And that feels really snaky to me. That feels really like dishonest. And the fact that he would say that, I kind of wonder if he's got if he got a phone call from Gary after these public comments because he was airing some dirty laundry here. It's par for the course for Gary Bet. He's a sneaky little weasel. Like this is what he does. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I I'd be frustrated if I was his owner too. You buy this team, you pay top dollar, you pay over asking price to get the Ottawa Senators just because there was somewhat of a bidding war for this team's for some reason. And then you, you, this gets dropped in your lap. You have a good competitive team. You're losing a first round pick and it's a huge deal. And you lose one of your good young players and you have no idea about it. It's like you buy a car, a brand new sports car and you take it on the road. Then you, you drive five miles down the road and the exhaust falls off. And then the transmission goes and you realize it's been in three accidents, but no one told you about it. And it's just been fixed together with glue and staples and crap like that. And then you get fined by the city for the yeah, mess it made. <laughs> because your, your car is parked to the side of the road. It, 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 he bought a lemon, basically, and he's upset about it. He paid top dollar, he almost a billion dollars for this franchise, which is a lot of money for the Ottawa Senators, considering the state of their rank, the state of everything. It, it, it's... It's nice that he's coming out and saying stuff against Gary Bettman because I think owners are a little hesitant to. Gary does have a firm grip on these owners and GMs. He put, he likes to assert his dominance over them. He had a, a meeting before the season with all the GMs and coaches and owners and everybody involved and said, hey, let's not let's not get on the referees this year. Little stuff like that. Gary, Gary controls everything. He's he's very smart. But this stuff is par for the course for him. He just hit all of this information from every single owner. I guarantee all of the potential bidders had no idea that they were going to lose a draft pick. The NHL knew they were going to levy some some kind of suspension to this team or consequence because of what they did with the dead enough trade. They could, they could have let someone know, right? Like, hey, heads up. There, there's a suspension coming down the pipeline and one of your good young, young players being investigated investigated for gambling on hockey for Pete's sake. So I don't know. Is this good for hockey? No. At the end of the day, no. An owner is actively criticizing the GM and he's criticizing or not the GM, the commissioner, but I think it needs to be said. It's nice. These new owners coming in and kind of standing up to Batman and saying, this is not how business is done. Like let's, let's clean up our act a little bit because this is, this could have been avoided. Stupid Dorian. Dorian just, (laughs) 
<laughs> it's, just, it's wild. It's absolutely incredible. And they're looking at Shirelli too, of course. All right. Anything else on this, Tim? No, I want to talk about the uh, the Bruins game last night. Oh, what is going on with Boston? Is some uh, did someone pee in their cornflakes last week? You got Charlie McAvoy, his dirty head on OEL. Now you got Brad Marchand taking a pound of flesh out of Lilligren from Toronto. What is happening with these guys? Or is this just like normal Bruins fair? You saw Milan Lucic did it a few years back. They, they're used to dirty hits in Boston. They plot it. It's encouraged. Yeah. I thought Marshawn was done with all this slew footing crap and he's at it again. So yeah, the Bruins have not done a lot this week for uh to create good faith among all the rest of the fans in hockey because they already don't like him and then two kind of minimally minimum questionable, maximum viciously dirty plays. Okay, say that again. Week. Minimum questionable, maximum what? Viciously dirty. At a minimum, it's questionable these these hits. At a max it's as bad as it gets. Yeah. And you you felt you said some pretty strong words on, on McAvoy's hit on, on the last episode. Um, this one, this is a tough one for me. I watched the replay. I didn't watch the game last night. Hulu, by the way, ESPN Plus, they can't figure it out. Not the streaming wasn't working. Everyone was talking about it. Just a disaster. Um, so I couldn't watch it. I saw the replay on Twitter and it looked really bad. Like you're going into the corner full speed and he kind of shovels them and, and he goes... And I don't want to make it about me, but that's very similar to how I broke my leg. Full speed, skate first, straight into the boards. Um, he goes down the tunnel. He's hurt. There's a lot to unpack here. But just on the hit itself, I thought it was dirty. And I'm reading more, and Biz put out a tweet that was a little bit controversial, saying Little Green initiated the, contract, the contact. They kind of scrambling for position at that point. Marshawn won. Maybe it should be a tripping penalty, but not intention to injure, not a dirty play. Little Green goes mm. in. And people are kind of arguing on Twitter and Reddit. And the more I think about it, maybe he's got a point there. It doesn't look good. I don't think Marshawn intended to hurt him. but And I know what you're going to say. He's been in the league for 15 years. He's aware of where he is on the ice. He's aware of the position. He's aware of what he's doing with his stick. And he knows how fast he's going. And so this is a dirty play and he should be suspended. Is that about right? Yeah, moving on. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the thing is, if he wasn't prone to doing this maybe i would give him the benefit of a doubt yeah you can go back and find hit after hit after hit after hit of him lifting a guy's stick and taking out his feet from behind slew footing him all over the ice in the middle of the ice going into the boards by the bench everywhere it's him this is what brad marchand does and i haven't seen him do it in a few years but he did it last night and it's a dirty predatory hit who knows what's going on? Children keep said Lilligren's missing significant time. What that means, I don't know. He could have broke his leg like you did. It's a dangerous spot in the ice. They're going in. It's, it's a simple battle for a puck that got dumped in. It's a dumb play by Marshawn. I, I don't like it. I, I just, it's no part in the game. I got slew footed once by Scott Hartnell off a faceoff draw. Fell back, hit my head on the ice. It's a long way down for him. Once I start going, I can't stop myself and boom, bang my head. I, bah, I was so mad. I, I jumped him. I went right to the bench where he was changing. I jumped his ass. So I was like, this is not going to fly, man. So it's just a dangerous hit. We saw this in the Buffalo game too this week. And um, Jared Bedner commented on it. Kale McCarr going to uh, retrieve a puck behind the net. Kyle Poso gives him a little shot on his hips. The most dangerous point of the ice. He's like five feet from the boards. He's starting to slow down a little bit to pick up this puck. Ocposo gives him a little push on the hips. So incredibly dangerous. McCarr goes Bambi into the boards, hips spread wide. It's amazing he didn't break a, break a hip or a leg or twist and this and that. I don't know what's going on. These are two veteran guys, Marshawn and Ocposo. You think they'd have a little more respect for these good – anybody, respect for anybody. I don't care who it is. So it, it's, it needs to be addressed. There needs to be some kind of suspension. There needs to be some kind of response because the Leafs, Tim, you bring in Bertuzzi, you bring in Domi, you bring in Ryan Reeves. Was there any response to Marshawn taking out a defenseman with just a really dirty hit? No, none. And this is supposed to be a different Leafs team. This is supposed to be a team that was gritty, that had sandpaper, that finally had the enforcers and the, I don't know, the, the, tough guys on the team that were willing to stand up and not take this crap from other players because these the superstars were kind of on their own the last few years. 
and it's not. And like, and and everyone's talking about this clip where Marshawn's skating in front of the bench, mm-hmm. and you got Reeves, you know, John, Adam, and then Nylander just staring, and Tavares just standing. All the other guys just just looking at him, not saying a word. And Reeves is doing that. He would do that even if Marshawn hadn't made that play. He's doing that every commercial break, you know? So that's just like par for the course. And then he pans over to Tyler Bertuzzi, who's laughing at something Marshawn said, you know, like he's <laughs> like, he loves him. And so, and, and so I, I, I want to say there's a few guys, maybe even Carly, Carlo Koliakovo said, he's like, this is the only film I'm showing to this roster in the morning. It's like, watch this. I'm not, we're not watching any game tape. Watch this clip. You guys should be embarrassed. Yep. And, and he's right. Right. Yeah, the response there, if you're Ryan Reeves, and I know it's a close game. I know it's an interdivision rival. You want to win this game. Marshawn did not get a penalty. The response is you go out and you jump Marshawn. I know it's barbaric. I know it's old school, this and that. When you see your defenseman getting helped off the ice, going down the tunnel, he's not returning. He's out for who knows. You have to respond. I don't care if you take a 2-5 and a 10. There has to be some kind of response from Ryan Reeves, Max Domi, or Tyler Bertuzzi. That's why you guys were brought here. The Bruins are leaving this game laughing all the way to the bus and they're going home. It's it's a joke that there was no response. Marshawn's loving life right now. He's in the Leafs kitchen. He just got away with murder on the ice, basically. Not murder. People are going to grab that and run. But he it was one a very dirty hit. Didn't even get a stinking penalty. And he's laughing at Reeves on the bench. Reeves should have jumped over the bench the next shift, much like I did with Phil Kessel and said, I'm beating the doors off whoever you lined up next to me. You should have went over to J- Jim Montgomery, the head coach of the uh, Boston Bruins, and says, whoever you put out, I'm going to destroy right now. That's it. And then it would have been done. We would have taken care of business. Marshawn would have known, hey, well, maybe I don't do that next time. And we would have moved on. You would have had a two-minute penalty to kill because you would have got two for instigating, and that would have been the end of it. He didn't do it. it obviously, he didn't do it. It's frustrating because that's what you're there for. you know. You're just you're losing credibility by just sitting there yapping on the bench. It doesn't people look at that and they just laugh at you because they know you didn't do anything at the end of the day. And empty threats are useless. They're absolutely useless. So good for Marshawn. He got away with it. I don't think he'll get suspended because it's he's plays for the Bruins. Okay. And my <laughs> McAvoy just got four games, not three days ago. So let's not say the Bruins are above being suspended. And he's, guess what? He's appealing the suspension. Yeah, he is. But that's his, yeah. that's his. That has nothing to do with the league. That's his prerogative. That goes straight no. to Batman anyway. Oh, oh, shocker! We'll see Jacob's, where the suspension lands. Jacobs, ding, 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 ding. Oh, hey, for Gary, sure, it's me. It's me. Without, without, without a doubt. Did you get the gift basket, Tim? I've seen the inner workings of this machine. You have no idea. I've been suspended multiple times. The whole All Star game gave me a look behind the curtain. Who's back? Who's behind there pulling all the strings? It's Gary Bettman and it's his his owner, a little partnership he's got there, his group of flackies who he hangs around with. And Jeremy Jacobs is one of them. So I know how things go down. They can get stuff done if they want to. So we'll see where Charlie McAvoy's suspension ends up. It should have been seven to ten. He got lucky with only four, and now who knows where it's going to end up after Gary gets his greasy fingers all over it. But, but yeah. Gary can also increase it, too. You honestly believe he's going to increase it? <laughs> Bruins Bruins get a lot of bad hits from the league. They they got a target on their back, and nothing ever goes their way. So who, yeah. we'll know. who knows? Yeah, not a chance. But back to Ryan Reeves. He should have stepped up. I'm actually disappointed that he didn't have some kind of response there was there was no pushback it was just say la vie move on i'm gonna talk to you from the bench and that was it but i don't know maybe it's the coach he didn't put him out o'keefe didn't do anything for him but i it, it was a very lackluster response from the toronto Maple Leafs. they go on and lose the game it is what it is moving on what are we talking about next tip well okay the sharks okay. canucks game last night oh my gosh 10 to 1 i don't really want to spend a lot of time on the game itself Ten nothing. It was ten nothing at one point. Yeah, um, just embarrassing. It's almost like it's almost uh, embarrassing for the Canucks too. You know, it's just no. like you don't think so. It's it like are they embarrassed to win by that much? It's no. so strange. It's Do so, you know so strange. how fun it is? You don't, but it is so <laughs> fun to be on the ice when you're just dominating a team you I can relax like, you can have yeah. some fun and everybody's just loosey goosey and everything is going right you're scoring at will the other team's getting frustrated 
it's it's a fun time to be on the ice. You're you're racking up pluses. Tyler Myers was plus four. I don't think he's been plus four in probably <laughs> 15 years. His rookie like years. Yeah. yeah. So everything's going right for the Vancouver Canucks. It, it was a great game. They, no, they're not embarrassed whatsoever. So let me if ask anything, you this. Guys are getting power play time who don't deserve it. The fourth line guys, that's the best part. That's it's my third question. period. Yeah. What's your question? Eight, eight nothing after two. How many minutes are you playing in the third period? Oh, 10. I'm playing half the period. I'm never leaving the ice. It's so fun. It's, it really is a pleasure to get out there and just play. When you know you can make a mistake here and there, you're not going to get benched. It's it's a good time. But I think the bigger question here, there's two questions. A, have the Vancouver Canucks shed their persona as just a team that never is going to make it? Are they finally in the league of contenders with the New Jersey Devils, the Vegas Golden Knights, teams of that ilk that are going to be contending for a Stanley Cup? B, are the San Jose Sharks really this bad? Yes, Logan Couture hasn't played yet. He's been dealing with a lower body injury for the better part of a year and a half now. He almost came back. He had a bunch of setbacks. And now the coach has just basically shut him down. He said, I don't want you skating until you're back 100%. They're missing Couture. They've had some injury issues. Are they the worst team in NHL history, Tim? They played 10 games. They, they have one point. One. So it's a two-pronged question. Are the Canucks the real deal? And are the San Jose Sharks the worst team in NHL history? Um, second question, TBD, but yes, they are as bad as they seem. The Sharks, they have 10 goals for. They've scored 10 goals in 10 games, and they allowed 10 goals last night. It's that bad. So yes, I will this say is- this, in their defense, the last team to do that, to start the season with the 10 games and only scoring 10 goals, was the 2015-16 Anaheim Ducks. The Anaheim Ducks, the next 72 games, went on to rip off an incredible record. They won 45 of their last 70 games, first place in the Pacific Division. But they had Getzlaff and Perry and Murderers Row on the back end. So there is hope there. The last team that did it. Is there? Is there hope? Pretty well. What are we saying? Um, To answer your first question, no, I'm not in on the Canucks yet. This is not enough. This is a great start, 7-2-1. You're you're beating up teams. Not enough for me. This is the team that is just because it's the first 10 games doesn't mean that this is who they are because they've had 10 game stretches over the last couple of years where they fooled us. They fooled both of us and they usually do it later in the season. Um, and like we said before, like starting fast and starting having a good start to the season was so, so important. They didn't do it last year. They didn't do it the year before JT Miller talked about it, but no, I'm not convinced yet because don't you think they could easily go three and seven over the next 10 too and be like, Oh, they were, who they thought who we thought they were like they fooled us um, and we should have known better you know i'm drinking the kool-aid i i think this is a I different right. team from this is a different team from last year and i'll give you a couple of reasons why quinn hughes took i think everyone's criticism personal this offseason about his lack of defensive effort he Your struggles criticism. in the d zone mine mostly mine he actually did mention me i think he's playing great for the first 10 games his defensive game is sound him and Philip Ronick, who they picked up from the Detroit Red Wings last year, are playing great. Their average goals for five on five is hovering around like 53, 54%, which is really good for a defensive pairing who plays a lot of minutes against some pretty tough competition. So they are net positive every time they're out there, five on five. On the power play, it's a different story. The guy's un- amazing. He's one of the best offensive defensemen we've seen. Like it's it's him and Kale McCarr and Adam Fox. Like those guys are the creme de la creme. That's one, Quinn Hughes. The other one is Lias Pedersen. I'm here to officially state I was wrong three, four years ago when I came out against this kid because he was questioning whether to re-sign in Vancouver. He wanted to see how the team pans out, this and that. I, I was really critical of him. He's a heck of a player, Tim. He he has gotten stronger. He's developed. He's confident. He, You know who he reminds me of? And this is crazy, but Pavel Datsuk. He really like does. He sh- he's shifty. He he makes space on the ice when you don't think he can get to open ice. He just always finds himself in a good spot. He's very good with the puck. He's sneaky good around the net. We, even though he's a small guy, he's like 6'2", 180, but he finds space around the net. He's just a really good hockey player. His hockey sense is through the roof. I think he's taken his game to the next level where he's like, this is my team. Even though Quinn Hughes was named the captain, this is his team. 
it's it's remarkable how good this kid is. His ceiling is super, super high. And the third reason I'm up on this team is Rick Tockett. And the reason I'm high on this team because of Rick Tockett, they were beating the Nashville Predators the other day, I think three to one or something in the second period. JT Miller was maybe making some questionable decisions, this and that. And this is JT Miller who's had a great start. Him and Brock Besser playing great on the second line. Tockett benched him in the second period. He's like, you're done. I'm not playing you. You know, you weren't in position. You weren't maybe trying hard on the defensive end. Benched him, had a talk with him between periods, brought him back in the third period. JT Miller responded, got a goal. Everybody's happy. That doesn't happen with Bruce Boudreau, who's every player's favorite coach because he's just happy-go-lucky. There's no consequences. Everybody goes out and plays their own game, and who cares? We know we're not going to get in trouble. We're not going to get benched, this and that. Rick Tockett has brought a sense of stability to this team. He's brought accountability. And he's proving it night in and night out to their best players. When they're winning, he's still benching guys. So good for them. I think this is a different team from years past. I think they will make the playoffs. They're the highest scoring team in the league, Tim. 46 gold four, goals for in 10 games. Yeah, the 10 versus the Sharks help, but that's still a heck of a lot of goals. The next highest yeah. is like 42. So good for the Canucks. My question is, what's their ceiling? How high can they go? The ceiling is the cup. I think, think I think so? they, if everything goes right for them, sure. I, I'm still not convinced that it will, but like we know this team has been good on paper for several years, and we know when these guys are all doing what they're capable of, which right now is happening, that this is an elite team. We'll see if they can do it for 82. We'll see if they can do it in the playoffs. But yeah, that's their ceiling. And 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 they're really good between the pipes. They're really good in the back end. They probably will be a team that can add at the deadline. So yeah, I feel like they are a team that can go out and contend as at their high level. I'm not convinced they will, but yeah, I would say that's their ceiling. Yeah. I don't know if the cup is quite there yet. They would have to maybe add a piece, but yeah, maybe it was OEL. He was the problem all along. They get rid of him and all of a sudden they're flying, but good for the Canucks. It must be nice for those players to just kind of exhale after the first 10 games and look at their record and go, okay, we're not, we're not one and nine. We're not two and eights like they have been the last few years when they just start off atrociously and they have to claw their way back. They're like, okay, we're, we're like third place in the NHL right now. Life is good. On the other side of the coin, the San Jose Sharks, Tim, they got one point. Their goal differential so far is dash 35. They've given up 45 goals this year in 10 games. They're on pace for a goal differential of dash 285. That would by far set the NHL record. Last year, the Ducks had a terrible team and they were dashed 129. This Sharks team is out of sorts. They're bad in many, many different ways. They can't score. They can't defend. They're not tough. There's no life. Everything is going wrong. And their next three or four games, they play Pittsburgh, Philly, Oilers, Vegas, Anaheim, Florida, and St. Louis. Pretty beatable teams. Do you see this team picking up a win ever? Ever. Yeah. I mean, statistically, yeah, they'll win one or two of those games. You have to think they will, but these are not easy outs anymore. I mean, Pittsburgh is still a team that should be good. Oilers are struggling, but they're I think they're going to turn it around. Philly has been a tough out all year. They've been a surprising team. Vegas is incredible. Anaheim has five straight wins. Florida's doing well. The Blues, maybe, but they'll win one or two of those. This I have is to this, think. this is the stretch of the schedule that I picked. I was like, they could probably pick up a win. And you're telling me it's a hard schedule. I, in I don't think there's a lot of easy wins here. Oh, Tim, they're in, they're in for a tough dude. I don't have offhand what that Washington capital team was 20 years ago. I think it was 83. What their record was eight it, wins. Does this team have a chance to come close to that? They have 72 games. Now they've lost the first 10. 72 games, they have to get 10 wins. Do you think that's <laughs> that's not outrageous for them to be that bad? You're losing 10-1 to the Vancouver Canucks, for Pete's sake. Yeah, it's not out of the question. Remember that <sighs> graphic I sent you yesterday with like the, uh, I don't know, what stat was it? It was the defensive with the, the oh, XY yeah, axis. The efficiency for the defensemen. Yeah. And there was one outlier all the way to the bottom left, low on both the X and Y axis. And it was Mark Edward Vlasic, who's getting paid 7 mil for another two years. Um, just, yeah, <laughs> Poor the sharks. sharks are in tough and they're not, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, which is frustrating. I've been saying this for years with them. No one's listening to me. My career came in. I said, you got to sell everybody. 
He re-upped Thomas Hurdle, which was his biggest mistake. He didn't get much for Brent Burns. He couldn't find a trading partner for Vlasic. You signed Mario, Mario Ferraro to a deal, which was, uh, listen, he's not the guy. So you re up Logan Couture. I'm like, that was a mistake. They were grasping at straws. And now look, you have no talent in the prospects pool. Your vets are ugly. Your star players are not star players. Everybody's 30 years old and getting worse by the day. So I love the Sharks. I love playing there. But heads up, Sharks fans. You think this year's bad? It ain't going to get any better. Anthony Duclair is there just like, what am I doing here? (laughs) <laughs> and it's funny i was gonna talk about carlson just being glad he's not there anymore but here he is in the penguins last place in the metro so i mean he's not wow. this bad but still not much better all right tim let's get to some quick hits here and move on yeah these quick hits are brought to you by doordash when you want quick hits and you want quick delivery go to doordash use co- promo code nation 25 all caps for 25 percent off your first order and free delivery available only in canada coming soon to the united states the first one here, John, would you like the honors? I'm very happy about this first one. Um, Jonathan Drouin, a healthy scratch in Colorado's last game. Eight games played, zero goals, one assist. Do you remember how pumped up you were for him this season? How excited, optimistic you were for him? You're like, he's going to fit right in. It's going to be fantastic. You you were all over me for not giving this guy a chance. Oh, it's all about second chances. He's going to be fine. You're, you're so negative. Are you ready to eat crow that Jonathan Turan is just a bad hockey player? Can you please um, admit it? I was optimistic. I wasn't, and none of those other things. Optimistic is like, you oh, know what? Oh, stop. You He's going to get chances on a good roster, on good lines, and it didn't work out. So, bummer for him. It sucks. I mean, being a healthy scratch, no points, and oh, guys, one assist, one assist opening night, nothing else since. Yeah. What do you want me to Gal- say? Galchenyuk, they tried. Tatar, they've tried. Jonathan Duran, they've tried. It ain't working. You can't reinvent the wheel on these guys. Good. Well, I'm not glad. It's not good, but it was predictable. It just annoys me that you don't listen to me. I know what I'm talking about here. All right. Another, another one that I'm somewhat a little happy about, the Detroit Red Wings, the Iser plan. I was critical of him. Very critical. Said it's not working. I didn't like what you did this offseason. I think you paid too much. You gave up too much. You didn't get anything for all these players. Everybody was all over me. Oh, they're five and one in their first six. Debrinkett's got a million goals in his first seven and six games. He's going to win the Rocket Richard Trophy. You dummy, John. You big, stupid dummy. Well, fast forward a couple days, Tim. Maybe I was right. The Red Wings have lost four or five. Debrinkit's got zero points to last game. An assist. Not even an empty netter. Z- I can't hardly get an empty netter when you're losing games. Sorry, He's we, got, I, you lost it for a second. Zero points in the last what? Four games. Okay. Zero. No points, nothing. I think the Wings record is all smoke and mirrors. I went back. I'm like, who did they beat? Why was everybody so excited? They beat the Calgary Flames, who suck. They beat the Ottawa Senators, who are out of sorts. They beat the Pittsburgh Penguins, who are garbage. They beat the Columbus Blue Jackets, who are dumpy. And they beat the Tampa Bay Lightning, who were missing their star goaltender. Those are their five wins to start the season that everybody's so excited about. The Yeiser plan is working. Are you ready to maybe concede that the Wings aren't that team, Tim? That you have tattooed on your back? I never said the wings were that team. Don't just because you make a claim about something doesn't mean that I was wrong somehow. Oh man. Um, Yeah. They're not as good as that. I don't think, I don't think many, I don't know. Maybe people in Detroit thought they were that good, but I don't think most hockey fans thought they were this team, um, including us on the show, but still six, four and one. They're six, three and one in their last 10. They lost opening night. They're still fourth in the league in goals for still a solid team. Yeah. Will they make the playoffs? No. <sighs> no. I probably I think not. Pittsburgh will finish with a better record than Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What's well, going on with Carter Hart, Tim? He's hurt. Uh which Good. is a strange okay. one. Moving on. <laughs> okay. You don't want to do you want to talk about it more? What does a mid body injury mean? The abs. Abs. Right grind. around the belly button. Yeah. Okay. Middle of the body. He probably pulled some <laughs> Well, there's a musty abductor. You probably pulled that. 
the reaching for a, the is that what it is? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a reaching uh, for a buck or something. That's that's a tough one for a goalie. All right, you you came up with an interesting stat that I thought was pretty uh pretty wild. Canada has zero players in the top ten in scoring. Is this is this a sign of things to come, Tim? Because Canada is usually there, right? We we we're Mister Hockey when it comes to this sort of thing. Are we just not yeah. developing talented players anymore? <laughs> of course, that's not true. And this is uh, <clears throat> Jeff Merrick's tweet. Your your buddy there, um, but a lot of American, a lot of European, no Canada. And the top the top Canadian is uh, John Tavares at eighteen. I don't know if it's Fiala American. Mason McTavish is American. Yeah. It's strange. And I don't know, like, I don't have this backed up by anything, but this does not happen very often. It's usually it's like normal six or seven of these guys are Canadian, right? Well, so. we usually got Connor McDavid. That's but true. But he, he's playing through injuries. He's not his usual self. So Connor's looked very much human this year. It's opened the door for my favorite player, Jack Hughes, to steal the you, MVP this year. Jack Hughes, <clears throat> you do not have any claim to him. I've been putting my time in. I've been putting the work in for Hughes, both of them, for years. And I have the documentation to prove it. So. Those are my guys. No, you don't have the documentation. I'm pulling up my documentation right here. This is my fantasy team. I'm going to hold it up to the camera for you people who can't see. Who's that right there? Um, It's a little blurry. Braden Point. It's Jack Jack Hughes. I got to get a better camera. (laughs) And a better phone. And better headphones. iPhone 6. No, it's not. Plus. iPhone 6 Plus. Oh, okay. This is the Plus. Okay. Yeah. What are they at now on the iPhones? Like 12? It's not even numbers anymore. It's like X and titanium, titanium, titanium. Why? <laughs> All right, moving on. McAvoy is going to appeal a suspension. I don't know why. It's so dumb. I hope he gets more. And then, yeah, you mentioned the Ducks. Five straight after starting one and four. Uh, it's time to maybe rethink Trevor Zegras not doing anything, but the, everybody else starting to pick their game up pretty well. Well, isn't that strange that like they were playing well and they're they were supposed to be like their star player isn't. Um, but yeah, I think we should maybe maybe next week if they're still doing well, we'll spend a little time on them because Troy Terry's doing his thing. Mason McTavish is like twelfth in the league in points right now. Yeah, um, Leo Carlson's doing his thing, and so yeah, good good for them. Kind but of again, is this just a case because it's not a good co- competitive league out there? And so, did they get the opportunity to play some bad teams? When you look at the teams who they beat. They beat Anaheim last game. You go back into October, they're beating Pittsburgh. They're beating Anaheim, Philly. Arizona. Mm-hmm. Arizona, excuse me. Arizona, Pittsburgh, Philly. They had a nice win in Boston, 4-3. to three. But then, yeah, you get Columbus again. They're playing subpar competition. So, I, I don't know. Maybe I put too much weight in those sort of things because you have to beat the teams that are better that you're better than. So, good for them. It's nice. At least there's a couple California teams who showed up. LA's playing well. Anaheim's playing well. San Jose. <gasps> It ain't good. Anything else, Tim? Uh, no, no. Any plans for the weekend? I don't know. Oh, poker tournament tonight. Very excited. Nice. It'll be good. Other than that, what about you? Going out? Going to catfishing people? I'm six yeah. three. I promise. No. Yeah. No. No plans. No plans. Have you ever gone on a date? No. And then the person didn't show up. No. Because they saw you and were like, "Oh, <laughs> so I'm gonna go." Window. Yeah. Keep walking. No, nah. it's who, fascinating. Who wouldn't want to see this? Come on. I'm, I'm just, I'm just wondering. How many dating apps do you have on your phone? Two. What are they? Hinge and Twitter, or um, <laughs> Bumble. Hinge and Bumble. Yeah. What's the other one that's popular? Tinder. Not Tinder. Is that too sleazy for you? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I'm not very active right now. You're 31 right now, Tim. You got to get your stuff together. 33. 30, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, we got to get some. Hey, All right. Whoa. Pop trivia question. I just remember this. I, I forgot to put it on the agenda. Who is the longest tenured coach in the NHL right now with the same team? Longest tenured, same team. Oh boy. Um, is it Sheldon Keefe? Nope. Mm, I don't know. He's a cup winner. Well, it's not Bruce Cassidy, so I, I don't I don't know. John Cooper. Cooper, lightning. I like that. Yeah. He's he's still got a few years before he gets fired. <laughs> All right. Good question. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you guys next week. Cheers.